lucky enough to have Renee Valadares here for another new series on evidence that we are very excited about. Starting with this busy lawyers framework for tackling evidence, we are happy to have Justice Text sponsoring um, the first several episodes in this series. So we want to let our sponsor, Justice Text, talk to you for a minute or two about the really exciting work they do and how it might be helpful to your practice. And to do that, I will turn it over to Dave Shimarota to tell you about Justice Text for a moment. Awesome. Thanks so much, Vanessa. And hi, everyone. Really excited to be a part of this Engage and Exchange session. My name is Dave Shi. I'm one of the founders of Justice Text, and I'm really looking forward to sharing a couple of minutes about what we're up to. Um, essentially, Justice Text is a tool that's designed to help specifically criminal defense attorneys save time reviewing audio and video evidence. This includes body cam footage, interrogation videos, jail calls, all of that. Um, and so just for a couple of seconds, I'll show you what the tool looks like to give you a sense of um, how it works and happy to answer any questions in the chat as well. Justice Text is a website where you can go in and start uploading files um, involved in any of your cases. Let's say you just got five body cam files in a recent case. You can just click on it and upload it directly to our system. And then what we'll do is spend a couple of minutes and generate a rough automated transcript of any speech that we were able to detect in that interaction. So let's say you're scrolling through, getting a general sense of what was being talked about in this conversation. You can click on any section in that transcript, press play, and the tool will take you immediately to that point in the video. All right, can I have your license, please? Do you know, that, do you know the guy in that other car? Let's say this section of the video was really important. You wanted to use it in a cross-examination or an impeachment. You could just go in, highlight that portion, press clip, give a name to your clip. And after a couple of seconds, what we'll do is create a short MP4 file um, of just that tiny section of the larger interaction. And so a lot of folks have found this to be really helpful as they're prepping for in-court appearances. Um, and this is kind of what that output looks like. Can I have your license, please? Do you know? One last thing that I'll go over really quickly. One of the cool new features that we're really excited to have released within the last couple of weeks is this um, automatic detection of key moments. And so what we do is scan your entire file, automatically tell you when someone was read a Miranda warning, when someone was administered a field sobriety test, and we're always adding more and more key moments to kind of this database. So always excited for feedback. Um, and we actually started building Justice Text as a school project while I was still in college a couple of years ago. And we really wanted to see how we could build technology for defenders to help laying, uh, level the playing field a little bit. The tool is $100 a month. We're happy to you know, dive into more details on a demo later on. Um, but for now, I will hand it over to Renee and thanks everyone once again. Thank you so much, Dave Shi. And I put the link in the chat for more information and you can contact them directly and I'll give you information throughout the program. But for now, the moment you all have been waiting for, um, and that is to kick off the first episode in this series. And I will remind you all, as um, Renee is setting up his PowerPoint, that the next episode is on February 8th. So if you haven't registered for that yet, go ahead and do it and we'll let you know the other upcoming episodes. So we're very pleased to have someone who is not just the federal public defender for the District of Nevada, but an adjunct professor at UNLV Boyd School of Law and part-time instructor at the UNLV Criminal Justice Program. He's a nationally known lecturer on criminal law and criminal procedure issues, including conspiracy, search and seizure, and the impact of culture on the criminal justice system, including um, publications such as co-editing the first edition of the treatise Cultural Factors in Criminal Defense, which is now in its fourth edition. And um, extremely relevant to why we are all here today, um, writing the uh, evidence book that we will put the that we will put in the chat, um, a defender's guide to federal evidence. So we couldn't be more pleased to have Renee here, and we want to hear him talk, not me. So Renee, I'll turn it over to you and remind everybody to please submit your questions that we will have answered during the program. 
Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. And it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, let me start by, by thanking Vanessa and, and thanking her for making this happen. It's great to work with, uh, with NACTO and, and really all the amazing work that they do to support us as uh, criminal defense lawyers. Um, so today, what we'll be doing is that we'll be going over a framework on how to tackle evidence. Um, now, uh, allow me one moment here. And the, um, in great part, the presentation will follow the, uh, the, the kind of how the book is set up, the structure of the book, the book that Vanessa talked about. And that's a Defender's Guide to Federal Evidence, which covers all of the articles in the rules, the federal rules of evidence. It gives commentary. And in addition to that, it gives uh, a series of, uh, of uh, for every rule, uh, defense favorable cases, cases that each one of us can go ahead and use to help us advance our arguments. In addition to that, um, all proceeds, all royalties that I that I that I that I make uh, go to support NACTO's Fund for Criminal Justice and really the outstanding work that they do in trying to go ahead and advance uh, criminal justice reform, uh, which is of course desperately needed. Now. Um, Let's go ahead and uh, oh, before I before I start with the actual presentation, this is my my uh, email. Please don't hesitate to go ahead and reach out. I very much enjoy talking to people about evidence issues. I frequently get questions dealing with evidence, and uh, if you have an issue in one of your cases or whatever that you want to go ahead and brainstorm, you know, please go ahead and do that especially since uh, obviously the amount of time that we have here today is very limited and the scope of what we're going to be you know talking about is very very extensive so don't hesitate to go ahead and reach out to me and uh if you have uh, again anything that you like to go ahead and brainstorm an evidentiary issue in a case or that sort of thing uh please don't hesitate to do that and uh, uh I was very impressed with the demonstration by Justice Text. It seems like that's an outstanding product. Um, we get a tremendous amount of body cams and that sort of thing in our practice here in my office. So certainly it seems like that kind of product would be extremely helpful. Now, um, the, the, the theme uh, of the, the PowerPoint is a nautical theme. And let me talk about why. So here you have you know, very, very troubled waters, very, very choppy waters in front of uh, Cape Horn, you know, off the coast of Chile, which is considered to be, of course, one of the toughest passages uh, maritime wise. It's a very difficult, very challenge, uh, challenging passage for ships. Now, the reason why I selected to do that is because oftentimes when you're in the middle of a trial, you know, that's how you feel like, you know, the judge is breathing down your neck. Your client is obviously freaking out. The prosecutor is trying to look for any kind of opportunity to go ahead and take advantage of the situation and that sort of thing. So sometimes or oftentimes in a trial, you kind of feel like this picture. You know, you feel like you're navigating or trying to navigate you know, very troubled, very difficult waters. And, uh, and that's the reason why I did, you know, this, uh, the, the theme is a nautical one. And uh, well, I tried to provide here is, you know, it's a compass, a sextant to help us navigate those very troubled waters. Now, um, the way that I wanna do it is that in talking about a framework for evidence, obviously it's impossible to talk about you know, everything evidence related. But my goal here is to try to go ahead and cover the big four. Now, we can go ahead and debate whether, you know, whether another issue may be more important than this four, for instance, say, you know, authentication uh, or, or whatever. But nonetheless, clearly, we would all agree that these are huge topics in evidence, relevance and prejudice, uh, character evidence, opinion, testimony, as well as hearsay. And what I've done in this presentation 
is that I've taken about 10 hours of materials, basically uh, what would be a seminar of about a, 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 a day and a half to two days, uh, condensing them, trying to condense them into two hours. It's a tough feat, but we'll try to go ahead and cover at least the big stuff, you know, dealing with, again, these big topics. Now, if, you know, if I'm not covering, you know, a specific topic in one of this uh, big four, you know, certainly, you know, and, and you have questions about it, again, don't hesitate to go ahead and reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to go ahead and talk to you about it. Now, uh, out of this four topics, um, last year, you know, uh, Vanessa was kind enough to go ahead and invite me to do presentations on character as well as hearsay evidence. And there should be recorded, uh, I, there should be two presentations for character, two presentations for hearsay, where I am diving into these topics at great length. Um, here again, I will deal with them in a much more condensed fashion, but the idea is that this presentation will serve to go ahead and, you know, when you're going to trial, you want to go ahead and kind of, you know, take a look of an overview of evidence, especially these big topics, and this will help you with that. In addition to that, uh, my PowerPoint is available to all. This is something that you can take to trial. You can quickly review what are the main points in uh, each one of these topics. Now, so what I'm going to do is that when I'm shifting, for, shifting from one topic to another, you will go ahead and see the screen. You will go ahead and see the Jolly Roger. And then you will see the topic that I'm going to be addressing highlighted. So we're going to go ahead and start with relevance and prejudice. And uh, I'll talk about relevance and prejudice. Uh, and this will be probably our shortest topic. Then I'm going to go ahead and talk about the other three at more length. Now, so when I start one of the topics, I'll go ahead and give you, you know, a little, um, a, a little flow chart on how to go ahead and tackle that topic. And of course, with relevance and prejudice, you know, we're looking at federal rules of evidence 401 and 403. And the, the fundamental issues, of course, is, are, is the evidence relevant and is the, pro the probative value of that evidence substantially outweighed by danger. Now, so let's start with uh, Federal Rule of Evidence 401. And, um, uh, you know, an item or a statement is relevant according to 401 if, you know, it has, if that item, if that statement, you know, has any tendency to make a fact more or less pro probable, and the fact is of consequence in determining the action. That's the black letter definition of uh, what is relevant. Of course, that's not very helpful to us. Let's go ahead and really look at it more from our standpoint. And of course, here I'm taking the position that for the most part, uh, we're looking at evidence from the standpoint of the government trying to bring it in. You know, three fourths of the time, that's what's going on. Uh, perhaps one fourth of the time we're trying to bring in evidence, but for the most part, it is the government that is trying to bring it in and we're trying to see how to exclude it. I will also have comments, of course, on, you know, on a situation where we are the ones, we as defense lawyers are trying to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and introduce evidence. Now, so really, as far as relevance, the key thing is that the, the standard under federal rule of evidence 401 is extremely low. And this is something that is frequently exploited by prosecutors. Prosecutors exploit this. They realize that, you know, judges think that, again, the standard for relevance is very low. And then, you know, prosecutors will try to go ahead and bring in a whole host of, of uh, evidence in uh, that, are, that are areas that are very problematic for us. And unfortunately, you know, they, uh, there's a, a, a lot of bad law out there. Um, amongst the categories of evidence that oftentimes prosecutors will try to go ahead and introduce uh, are issues such as consciousness of guilt, for instance, flight, possession of uncharged weapons, you know, gang affiliation, proof of financial hardship, et cetera, tattoos, et cetera. 
Now, and again, you know, prosecutors would capitalize on the fact that the standard is a low one. Now, let's look at two of these areas. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the issue of flight, and I'm going to be looking at the issue of uncharged weapons. What I want to do is that I want to go ahead and give you two examples of, of uh, how cases that have been favorable to us as defense lawyers have tackled these issues. Let's go ahead and start with the flight, okay? And this is a defense favorable case. All the cases I wanna be talking about, or at least at some length, uh, are defense favorable. I'll be talking about, uh, I'll be giving you about 10 cases, a little bit less than that. Um, and, uh, um, and, and I will go ahead and talk about them at some length. When I talk about a defense favorable case, you will have this screen right here that you can easily identify this is a defense favorable case uh, for us. So this is uh, this is a really great case. Uh, this is a Glenn case, a Second Circuit case, and uh, uh, and let's let's talk about it um, a bit. What happened here is that the defendant uh, went to trial. Uh, the defendant was convicted, and uh, uh, the defendant was convicted of, amongst other things, murder. Now. The, one of the key pieces of evidence that the, 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 the prosecution had here was uh, what, the, what the government argued was evidence of flight in the part of the defendant. The defense objected to it, but the court, the district court, let it in. Now, the, the government argued that the defendant fled the scene and the, the government argued that this uh, flight was evidence of guilt, uh, of consciousness of guilt. Now, again, as I said, the district court let it in. The Second Circuit, however, reversed. And the, circuit, the Second Circuit um, uh, concluded that uh, the defendant's behavior in this case was insufficient to prove flight. Now, the Second Circuit, of course, acknowledged that flight can, in certain instances, be uh, be evidence of uh, of uh, consciousness of guilt. But in this case, that was unsupported by the record. And again, this is one of the areas where the government will, you know, will try to capitalize on the low standard for relevance, and will try to go ahead and and uh, and present evidence of flight, you know, which ends up being just junk evidence like the second circuit concluded here now what happened here is that the uh, uh, according to the circuit the evidence the, uh, didn't have any indication of really suspicious behavior that would indicate flight such as for instance the defendant receiving a ride shortly after the shooting demanding a ride running, uh, requesting to be taken to a remote location, anything like that, that perhaps may go ahead and indicate consciousness of guilt. Instead, what had happened simply is that shortly after this shooting, after this murder, the defendant did ask someone for a ride, but that didn't, again, involve, you know, demands to you know, aggressive demands to be taken uh, uh, or, or to be given a ride or running or a request to be taken to a remote location, anything like that. The Second Circuit concluded, well, yes, indeed, the defendant uh, asked for a ride. There was no additional evidence that really supported a conclusion that that was for the purposes uh, of fleeing the scene. There was no evidence of consciousness of guilt. And in this case, according to the circuit, the government did not prove that the defendant engaged in flight and uh, would add it to the balance of its proof. This evidence provided very little in the way of movement or the threshold of reasonable doubt. A nice case, again, if you're faced uh, with the situation of the government trying to go ahead and show consciousness of guilt through flight. Now, another example that I want to talk about, and this is, again, another one of those situations where the government tries to exploit the very low standard 
uh, of uh, uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, relevance, and that is uncharged weapons in a case. This is a great case for that, the Ferreira case. This is a first circuit case. Now, all these cases are in my PowerPoint, you know, and you can go ahead and use them if, again, you're trying to craft arguments to uh, deal with consciousness of guilt, like in flight, or if you're trying to deal with something like this, like uncharged weapons. Now, what happened here is that the defendant was charged and convicted at trial of unarmed bank robbery. Now, at this at, at trial, the district court allowed into evidence two unloaded firearms that were seized from the defendant when the defendant was arrested. Now, here again, the defendant had objected, you know, to the introduction of this uh, evidence of the two firearms. The defendant argued that it was uh, irrelevant, that the two firearms were irrelevant and they did not advance in any way the government's case. Uh, the district court saw it, of course, differently, as it often happens, uh, but the First Circuit remanded for a new trial holding that the district court abused its discretion. According to the courts, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Court of Appeals, uh, according to the First Circuit, the uh, firearms did not make any fact material to the indictment more or less probable than it would be without the evidence. Of course, that's a requirement of Federal Rule of Evidence 401. The court noted that there was no foundation on the on the uh, no foundation testimony in the record showing that the defendant had uh, at the time of the robbery carried any firearms, used them to threaten anybody or anything like that. Um, and uh, uh, and in fact, uh, the court also noted the court of appeals noted that the the defendant didn't open the door to the introduction. Of, uh, of, of this evidence in any way. Because of that, the First Circuit reversed and remanded the case. Again, another case that, you know, that, that is a nice case to have there in case you're arguing something, uh, something like this. Now, so I gave you two examples of the government trying to argue such things like uh, consciousness of guilt, flight, uh, possession of uncharged weapons, uh, and that sort of thing. Now let's move to instances where we are trying to go ahead and introduce evidence. Now, the easiest way to go ahead and argue for evidence that you know we're trying to uh, to 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 introduce is to tie it, of course, to the theory of defense and to argue that you know that the exclusion of the evidence would prevent a defense from presenting. Uh, 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 it's defense in, in, in trial. So again, the, the, the key thing to do from our standpoint is to try to go ahead and tie you know, that piece of evidence, that statement or item in evidence to our theory of defense. Another item that, another point that is very important to keep in mind is of course, from our standpoint, bias and credibility are always relevant. You know, so if, if you're talking about the credibility of an informant, uh, the bias of a witness and that sort of thing, all that will always be relevant. This is going to play a role when we get to our discussion dealing with character, but it's something that's always very important to keep in mind. Bias and credibility are always relevant. Now, to the prior point, to the issue of relevance and theory of defense, let me go ahead and talk uh, about this case. This is a uh, uh, another nice case to have there uh, in our toolbox when we're trying to go ahead and make arguments before the court, before a court. Uh, this is the Stever case. This is a Ninth Circuit case. And what happened here is that um, the defendant was convicted of conspiracy to manufacture a thousand pounds or more, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, or manufacture a thousand or more marijuana plants uh, after the police discovered uh, a, a growth operation uh, within the corners of his uh, uh, 400-acre property. Now, what happened here is that uh, the defense was that the, uh, the, uh, the acres that were cultivated 
uh, in, uh, uh, that, uh, that had marijuana, that they were not the property of the defendant, that the defendant didn't even know about them, that instead they had been planted by a Mexican drug trafficking organization. That was the defense. Now, uh, prior to trial, the defense tried to go ahead and obtain uh, evidence dealing with this Mexican drug trafficking organization. The defense made discovery requests dealing with that, and the defense intended to make uh, to make this Mexican drug uh, trafficking organization an issue at trial. Well, the district court wasn't having it. The district court did not allow uh, for discovery in this area. Did not allow any discovery dealing with this Mexican drug trafficking organization, and the district court was not going to allow any evidence of that at trial either. Well, the defendant ended up getting convicted at trial, unsurprisingly, uh, since this evidence, this key evidence, was uh, basically excluded by the court as well as the the supporting discovery. Uh, but the circuit, you know, saw it differently, and the circuit, um, the circuit reversed. The Ninth Circuit noted that under federal rule of evidence 401, of course, again, the rule that deals with relevance, evidence is relevance if, as we already discussed, it has any tendency to make the existence of any fact that is of consequence uh, more or less probable than it would be without the evidence. In this case, the, the circuit noted that absolutely, the evidence of this Mexican drug trafficking organization does tend to show that um, that that uh, uh, because of that evidence, it would provide an alternative uh, explanation for the marijuana, and it would you know it would tend to show that the defendant was not the one that did it; that instead the responsible party was this organization, the drug organization. So the Ninth Circuit held that the district court abuses discretion in concluding that this discovery was not relevant, that the issue of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, drug trafficking organization was uh, irrelevant uh, and, uh, uh, and ended up reversing the case. Now, so those are uh, a few matters dealing with relevance with Federal Rule of Evidence 401. Now, let's look at the other side of the coin. And of course, that is, uh, uh, federal Rule of Evidence 403, and that is the balancing, the balancing of the probative value with uh, uh, the danger of um, unfair prejudice. Now, so 403, of course, allows courts to exclude relevant uh, if the, the uh, value of the relevant, uh, if the probative value of the relevant is substantially outweighed by danger of unfair prejudice confusion of the jury or waste of time. Now, I unfortunately, I think that in most of our experiences, you know, we, uh, we can safely conclude that probably the most, uh, the, the, at a, at a, the, the reasons here, the ones that oftentimes courts will go with is waste of time. You know, a lot of times a judge will not be very sympathetic to the defendant being prejudiced, may not be very sympathetic to the jury being confused, but the court is going to be very sympathetic uh, to its time, you know, being wasted. You know, the judge is thinking, hey, I may have a, you know, golf game or whatever. I don't want, you know, uh, uh, the time to be wasted. And consequently, it may conclude that, you know, in fact, they, uh, um, that, you know, federal rule of evidence uh, 403 applies and that the evidence should be excluded. Now, um, the uh, evidence is unfairly prejudicial if, you know, if uh, it tends to produce a jury decision based on a proper ground. And this is typically an emotional ground, uh, unrelated to whether the defendant is guilty or not. A nice example of that is the um, Moya case. This is a Second Circuit case. And uh, in this case, what happened is that uh, the defendants were convicted of conspiring to provide material support 
to uh, Hamas and Al Qaeda, uh, to terrorist organizations. Now, at trial, the government presented extensive evidence, including uh, the presentation of witnesses that discussed at length a suicide bombing that had taken place in Tel Aviv. Now, um, this, uh, this suicide bombing uh, was set off a bus and uh, a number of individuals were killed, including uh, an individual that was a cousin of one of the witnesses that the government presented. This witness present, uh, testified at length about the bombing, about his cousin dying, uh, and graphically uh, discussed, you know, the uh, the the bus, the, the bombing of the bus uh, in detail and all that. Now, all this is over the objection of the defense. Now, um, the the uh, uh, on appeal, the defendants argue that the district court uh, abused of discretion, that this evidence should have been excluded. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the defendants were not charged with that evidence. Instead, the government was trying to use that evidence to show, number one, that those two organizations were indeed terrorist organization, uh, organizations, uh, Hamas and Al-Qaeda, and that the defendants knew about that, that the defendants knew that these were uh, terrorist organizations. The defendants are argued at a trial level that, you know, first of all, they were not even involved in that bombing. Number two, they were not contesting the issue that Hamas or Al Qaeda were terrorist organizations. Uh, they're, they're, what they were contesting is that, you know, they were indeed involved in a conspiracy to provide material support to those organizations. Nonetheless, the district court ended up allowing the evidence. The, the circuit court, you know, said that again, the district court had abused its discretion. The, uh, um, the government argued that that evidence was necessary to show that the defendants knew that these organizations were terrorist organizations. But the, uh, the second circuit noted that neither of them uh, denied knowing about Hamas, neither of them denied knowing about Hamas's involvement in violent acts and that sort of thing, but that they were simply disputing, again, their involvement and support of those organizations. They were arguing that they, they in no way they were supporting, uh, materially supporting those organizations. The Second Circuit held that the district court erred in admitting the testimony because its probative value was outweighed by its unfair prejudice. Uh, and in this case, because the error was not harmless, the Second Circuit vacated the convictions. Um, Vanessa announced that next month on the 8th, uh, we will have another presentation. It will be another part of this series. That's going to be on objections. It's a great presentation. You know, I strongly encourage you to attend it. I think it's a fun one. And uh, in that presentation, we do get into much more depth as to, you know, when is an error harmless, when is an error not harmless, and that sort of thing. You know, suffice it to say for our discussion today, in this case, the circuit concluded, the Second Circuit concluded that the error here was not harmless and reversed. Now, so that's in a nutshell, some of the issues that come up when it comes to relevance and prejudice. Uh, and now we're gonna go ahead and get into the all important topic of character and bad acts. Like I said, you know, last year I gave a presentation uh, dealing, I gave two presentations for a total, I think it was so far, four hours dealing with character and bad acts. What I'm gonna do is highlight so, some of those points and uh, um, those presentations should be uh, available to you um, by um, uh, in, uh, recorded. You know, you can go ahead and watch them, you know, at your leisure. And of course, in those presentations, I go into uh, into character at significantly more depth than I'm gonna be able to do it today. You know, however, let's go ahead and look at a framework of how to tackle character. So first of all, uh, you know, we start with, does the evidence actually involve 
character or does it involve prior bad acts? If it does, then does the evidence fall under one of the exceptions under the rules for the defendant or the victim? We'll talk about that in just a moment. If not, does the evidence involve the uh, in, involve character in the context of a witness? Not the defendant, not the victim, but rather a witness. Now, then we go into is 404B implicated? And then finally, does the evidence involve similar crimes in a sexual assault or child molestation case? Okay, um, those cases have its own very unique implications and its own, their own very unique dangers as well. So here, let's go ahead and, and, and first start by talking about a propensity uh, prohibition. Of course, uh, uh, according to the federal rule of evidence 404A, character is not admissible to prove action in conformity. Uh, the fact that, you know, that I'm a liar doesn't mean that I lied this time. That's, you know, basically what, you know, the rules entitled to do. The fact that I'm violent doesn't mean that in this instance, I was violent. Uh, and of course, you know, that same prohibition takes place not just for character, but also for specific acts. Uh, so again, the idea is that you know, a defendant should be judged for what they did, not who they are. That's a propensity prohibition. Now, uh, in this context, we have to be extremely careful about opening the door. You know, uh, like for instance, you know, potentially say, arguing, asserting, and trapping. In this case, for instance, in Roper, uh, the defense, you know, ran an entrapping defense and, uh, um, very negative evidence came in as far as the defendant's character on prior acts. And uh, uh, the, the circuit, in this case, the Sixth Circuit concluded, well, the defendant opened the door by arguing and trapping. So we have to be very careful about opening the door when it comes to issues dealing with character. Now, before we start going into the, the different exceptions to the propensity prohibition, let's talk about methods of proving character. Now, so uh, typically character is proved by reputation or opinion evidence. Those are the classic ways of proving uh, character. So, you know, if I wanna go ahead and present positive evidence of my client's reputation for peacefulness, I'll go ahead and call a witness. The witness would talk about my client's reputation or you know, would talk about my client's opinion for being a peaceable person. Now, the, the opposing party, say in this case, the government would be allowed to also on cross-examination of those witnesses uh, at the court's discretion, uh, would be allowed to inquire into relevant, specific instances of the defendant's, of the person's conduct. Now, uh, so again, if I'm presenting uh, positive evidence of my client's straight for peacefulness, the prosecution would be not only able to go ahead and rebut that with their own witnesses, but they would also be able to cross-examine my witnesses and ask them about specific instances of you know my client of, of my of my client's conduct. Uh, of course, that would be uh, negative instances of my client's conduct. This is, however, at the court's discretion. In addition to that, the prosecution is would be stuck with the answer of their witness. They cannot bring in extrinsic evidence for that. So, to summarize. Uh, Typically, character is proven by reputation and opinion, and the opposing party would have the ability to cross-examine the court's discretion dealing with specific instances of that person's conduct. Now, there is there are instances under 405B, Federal Rule of Evidence 405B, where you can actually get into specific instances of conduct. These are very rare. Very rare, especially for us in criminal in, in, in the criminal context. 
and uh, and it only applies when a person's character uh, is involved as an essential element of a charge, claim, or defense. That would take place in the context, say, of an entrapment defense. So, for instance, in the case that I discussed before in Roper, the defendant raises the issue of entrapment, presents evidence dealing with entrapment, uh, the defendant testifies about never having, you know, had feelings in drugs before. So at that point, what happens in opening the door is that, first of all, the prosecution is able to cross-examine the defendant dealing with prior instances of uh, drug dealing. So you got that, number one. Then number two, since this involves uh, an, an essential element of the defense, then at that point, you know, the prosecution was also able to present an agent that is extrinsic evidence, evidence, you know, another witness testifying about specific instances in which the defendant had sold drugs. But this is going to be, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is going to be rare. So specific instances of conduct uh, not a cross-examination, by, by presenting actual witnesses, that is going to be a very rare instance uh, that we will see in the criminal context. Now, so let's go ahead then and talk about the exceptions to the propensity rule. And, they, uh, and there's a number of them. You know, first, uh, you have evidence of the defendant's good character. You also have the government's right to rebut that. In addition to that, you can present evidence of the victim's bad character, and the government has the right to rebut that as well. And then also uh, you have the government's right to rebut evidence that the victim was the first aggressor. And finally, we'll talk also about um, the prohibited use of victim sexual behavior of this or disposition. So I'll talk a, a little bit about each one of this and the next following slides. You know, and again, I repeat that you know um, that there's there's recordings out there uh, that you can that you can watch uh, that where last year I covered uh, character at much greater length than what I'm going to be able to do here today. Now, so evidence of good, you know, of the defendant's good character, you know, let's uh, let's quickly, you know, cover that. First of all, um, it's got to be a, a, a pertinent trait. Pertinent is basically synonymous with relevant. It's got to be a relevant, you know, uh, trait. And I'll give up some examples in just a second. Now, um, it, from our standpoint, reputation for being law-abiding uh, that our client is law-abiding, that's always relevant, okay? Always relevant, and you can always, you know, present that. Now, the ways that we can prove that are through reputation and opinion, okay? So you can present an evidence, uh, a witness to talk about, you know, your client's reputation for being law-abiding or any other pertinent trait that you may want to. You know, we have that. That is the mercy rule. This is one of the very few instances where the rules of evidence favor our clients. That comes, however, at a very heavy price. And that is that, as you can see from the column to the right, four of Federal Rule of Evidence 4482A gives the government the right to rebut that. So if we present evidence of our you know, clients' uh, positive trait for law abidingness, for instance, the prosecution can, you know, present evidence that that is not the case. Um, and uh, the, the government, however, has to stick to the same character trait. So, for instance, if, you know, I present evidence uh, of my client having um, character trait for peacefulness, the prosecution can present evidence of my client having a character trait for violence, but not for my client being uh, a drunk or my client uh, being a liar, 
and that sort of thing. So it's got to be the same trade. The prosecution has the ability to present reputation or opinion evidence. And on cross-examination, the court may allow the prosecution to talk about specific instances of conduct. Now, examples of character traits for a defendant that we can bring up, that we can raise. Now, uh, again, if the crime involves violence, peacefulness. If the crime involves honesty, then, you know, then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if the crime involves criminal intent or deceit, then, you know, a pertinent trait would be honesty and, and, and so on. Now, uh, again, the trait has to be a pertinent trait, cannot be just any, you know, any, any, any trait. It has to be a pertinent one. Now, um, so we talked about one of the exceptions to the propensity rule is the fact that we have the right to present positive evidence of our clients. Of course, the danger with that is that the prosecution can go ahead and rebut that, and that's a serious danger. Now, the second exception is that we also have, under the mercy rule, the right to present evidence of of uh, the victim's character. That is, you know, uh, pertinent traits that are negative traits in the part of the victim. Typically, this is going to be uh, violence. You know, uh, uh, this is going to be an issue, say, dealing with violence. Now, the way we have to prove that is, again, by reputation or opinion. Uh, we can go ahead and call a witness to talk about, you know, the reputation or the opinion that the victim had uh, in the community for being, say, violent and that sort of thing. Now, again, the, if we do that, the uh, prosecution uh, will be able to go ahead and cross-examine uh, our witnesses. Now, an important limitation on this rule is federal rule of evidence 412, and that is the victim's predisposition in sex cases. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Before we talk about that, however, let's look at the fact that, you know, if we do present uh, negative evidence of the victim's character, then the government has the right to rebut that, uh, just like it did if we present evidence of uh, positive traits in the part of our client. The problem there, however, is that not only can the government offer evidence of the victim's good character, the government also under the rule has the, the, uh, the right to, to present evidence of the, our client's same trait. So if we attack our, the victim's uh, uh, character as being, say, violent, then the government has the right to go ahead and attack our client's uh, 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 character trait for being violent as well. So it's, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it could be a costly bargain. It's something that, again, you know, that we need to, to be aware of and that in the right case, you know, we can go ahead and use that tool, but it can certainly come with a heavy price. So this is victim's character. Now, um, in a homicide case, another exception to the propensity uh, rule is that in a homicide case, the, the, uh, uh, the government uh, has the right to rebut evidence that the victim was the first aggressor by presenting evidence of the victim's trait for peacefulness. This is in a homicide case. If you know, if we are arguing that the victim was a, the first aggressor, then the prosecution has the right to go ahead and offer evidence of the victim straight for peacefulness. Now, I, we talked about uh, obviously the um, uh, the exception. Uh, to the propensity rule in the context of the victim, how we're able to present negative evidence of the victim, how the government has the right to rebut that. An exception to the exception, however, a limitation on the exception is federal rule of evidence 412, that is the victim's character in sex cases. Okay, so let's talk about that. Now, federal rule of evidence uh, 412 
prohibits evidence that the victim engaged in other sexual behavior, number one, or that they of or of the victim's sexual predisposition. I'll talk about the, uh, the, the meaning of both sexual behavior and sexual predisposition in the context of a victim in, uh, in one of our next slides. But for now, let's go ahead and, uh, uh, and talk about the main thing for us. And that is that the, this exception to our ability to attack the victim has in turn a couple of exceptions that can be beneficial for us. And that is that we do have the right to go ahead and, and uh, um, bring up specific instances that it may, you know, that 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 may establish that the source of semen or injury or other physical evidence was someone other than our client. In addition to that, the rule allows us to go ahead and bring specific instances showing uh, consent, consent between the victim and our client, if that is relevant for the defense. So those are exceptions to the limitations created by 412. However, however, this rule creates a procedure to determine admissibility and that procedure we need to stick to very carefully because otherwise the, uh, the rule will bar us from, you know, from being able to avail ourselves of this exception. Now, um, I told you that I was gonna uh, talk a little further about what sexual behavior, what sexual predisposition. Sexual behavior, sexual predisposition has been given a very broad definition by the cases that interpret 412. It is not really defined in the rules, but the cases have defined it broadly to include any evidence of physical sexual or, or sexual, sexual conduct, evidence that may imply sexual conduct um, and, uh, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so anything dealing, for instance, with uh, use of contraceptives, birth of an out of wedlock child, venereal disease, et cetera, all that you know, is really out of bounds. In addition to that, uh, things like the victim's mode of dress, uh, lifestyle and all that, all that is also, in theory, out of bounds uh, based on federal rule of evidence 412. Now, um, I also mentioned that if we want to avail ourselves of the exceptions in criminal cases, that is, source of, uh, of uh, semen injury or other physical evidence or consent, that there is a procedure to determine admissibility. I mentioned that that procedure has to be carefully followed by us. And uh, the procedure is that uh, we have to file a motion describing the evidence and its purpose. We got to do it 14, years prior, uh, 14 days prior to trial. Uh, a motion has to be served on all the parties. Uh, the victim has to be notified, et cetera. Um, so if, if, you, if you have to, to go that route, you know, be sure to go ahead and follow carefully the procedures in federal rule of evidence 412C, because the cases interpreting the rule are, are, are pretty harsh for us, okay? If uh, we don't follow this uh, steps pretty closely, then uh, courts tend to go ahead and exclude, unsurprisingly. You know, if, uh, if it is the government that is uh, not following, you know, whatever procedure may be outlined by the rules, oftentimes, you know, the courts give the government a pass on that sort of thing. Uh, that is not what, you know, what, uh, um, what uh, the, the uh, cases uh, reveal when you read them uh, and when it's our, you know, when it's our turn. Now, um, so we talked about the exception to the propensity rule in the context of the defendant, in the context of the victim, uh, we talked about the mercy rule. We talked about how the government can go ahead and exploit that and the dangers of us, um, you know, going that route. But the fact that in certain cases it could be beneficial. Now let's shift gears and talk about the character of the witness. Okay, so now we're not talking anymore about uh, the defendant or the wit or or the, or the victim. 
we're talking about the witness. Of course, you know, the uh, uh, the defendant could be a, a, a witness and then this rule, this rule will come into play. When we're talking about the witness, a witness, uh, in the, uh, from the standpoint of character, the relevant character trait for a witness is truthfulness or untruthfulness. That is the uh, uh, relevant character trait. Now, evidence for for uh, for uh, truthful character can be uh, can be also used to support a witness, but it is only admissible after character for truthfulness has been attacked, okay? Now, oftentimes prosecutors will try to circumvent that. They cannot go ahead and support the truthfulness of a witness until the witness's uh, character for truthfulness has been attacked. Now, uh, the way to, 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 uh, uh, to establish uh, uh, character for, for untruthfulness if we're trying to attack a, um, a uh, witness, uh, a government witness, is opinion or reputation, like we already discussed. Now, uh, of course, another big, big area uh, is 609, Federal Rules of Evidence 609, and that is impeachment by evidence of a criminal conviction. Now, the critical thing here when it comes to 609 uh, are, are, are several factors, several drivers, and that is what kind of case is it? Uh, for instance, is, this, is a dishonest act involved or not? Uh, is the witness a defendant or not? How much time has passed? Uh, and that sort of thing. We're gonna be looking at, uh, at principally the top, the, the first three. And again, I'm doing that in an abridged fashion, as you can, you know, as you have access to the much more detailed presentations I gave last year on this area. Let's look first at um, if uh, the witness has a prior conviction and dishonesty is an element of that conviction. What happens then? How can we use that? If that is the case, if dishonesty or false statement is an element of the prior conviction of the witness, then uh, the, convi the conviction can always be used. The conviction can, can always be used to impeach the witness. It doesn't matter whether the conviction is a felony or a misdemeanor, the court has no discretion as far as balancing under 403, the conviction is coming in. The government presents a witness. The witness has a prior conviction. The prior conviction is for a false or, or, or has as an element of false statement uh, or it's an act of dishonesty. That conviction is coming in. It is, however, subject to the 10 year rule. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, what about if the conviction does not involve an act of dishonesty? Well, then in that case, uh, the, uh, uh, if it doesn't involve an act of dishonesty, then the analysis is materially different. Then uh, the conviction can only be used if it is a felony. And then, and then whether it comes in under 403 or not, whether it comes in, it depends upon who is the, um, who is the, the witness. If the witness is our client, if the witness is the defendant, then the, 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 uh, it, it can be used, the prior conviction can be used by the government only if the probative value of, um, it can be used against the defendant if the probative value of the evidence outweighs the prejudicial uh, effect. Uh, it should be an effect there, not evidence. So if it is a client, it comes in if the probative value of the evidence outweighs the prejudicial effect. If it is not our client, if it is not the defendant, then the conviction is coming in unless the probative value substantially is, is substantially outweighed by unfair prejudice. So our client, again, has a bit of an advantage. Again, this is one of the very rare circumstances 
where the rules give our clients a bit of an edge. Typically, the rules are, you know, are, are, are biased against our clients. That's the way it is. I mean, starting from the first thing we discussed, you know, uh, relevance. You know, relevance favors the prosecution. The rules of the rule of evidence favors the prosecution, generally speaking. Now, um, this is, however, also subject to the 10-year rule. Now, before we talk about the 10-year rule, let's talk about what is it that can come out. You know, so you have a witness on the stand, the witness has a, a conviction, uh, the witness uh, and the conviction can come in because it either involves a crime of dishonesty or because it's a felony uh, and, uh, and uh, under the rules they can come in. What can come in is something that is, is we need to be very mindful about because oftentimes prosecutors will try to go ahead and cheat. And they'll try to go ahead and, and bring in much more than what the rules really allow. According to the rules really it ought to be, and the, and the, the cases interpreting the rules, it really should be pretty limited. It should be the date of conviction, the jurisdiction of conviction, the offense or statute involved. Uh, we do have to, however, as always, be very careful about opening the door. Let's talk about the 10-year rule. Now, if more than 10 years have, uh, have elapsed uh, since the witness's conviction or release from confinement, um, the conviction will not come in. And of course, this is uh, conviction or release com from confinement under the rule is whichever is the later one. Now, the conviction does not come in unless the probative, the probative value substantially outweighs prejudicial, the prejudicial effect and the proponent of the evidence gives reasonable written notice, okay? So unless that, 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 those two uh, uh, requirements are met, the evidence cannot come in. Now, um, let's briefly talk about 404B. I deal with this topic at much greater length than one of the presentations I gave uh, last year, but you know, uh, and, and, but but really, the, the the big picture is that, of course, um, not only is character or propensity prohibited in the in the context of character, but also in the context of uh, of prior bad acts. So, you know, under Federal Rule of Evidence 404B1, um, the, uh, a prior bad act, a prior crime, a prior wrong should not be coming in um, to establish propensity. It can, however, come in if it falls under one of the, uh, one of the mimic designation, designation, that is motive, intent, modus operandi, identity, common scheme or plan, et cetera. Now, uh, I wanna talk about you know, how this rule you know, changed just two years ago. Uh, I wanna also emphasize that while we tend to think of this rule as a prosecution rule, it can also be used by the defense. And that's an important thing to go ahead and keep in mind. Now, um, it's important to keep in mind that you know this rule changed recently uh, in the last uh, in the last few years. The defendant now does not have to request notice anymore under uh, 44B. The prosecution has to provide it uh, automatically if it intends to use 44B evidence, uh, and the prosecution has to at least in theory now uh, do the following: identify the bad act, articulate the non-propensity reason that is. It's being used for motive, for identity, or whatever it may be. Provide the basis as to why that evidence is relevant, and do all that in writing prior to trial. Okay, so again, this is something that that uh, changed recently, um, but you know, but uh, oftentimes it's still not being abided by the prosecution. Now, a couple of arguments here, if we were facing with uh, an issue of 404B prior bad acts, you know, several arguments that we can raise, of course, is one, that the evidence the government's trying to present is nothing but propensity evidence, that the evidence is not relevant, that the evidence does not support a jury conclusion that the act was committed by the defendant, and more importantly, 
that it's not sufficiently similar. You know, that probably a later one is, uh, is where we can get most traction. Uh, sadly enough, however, uh, caseload is generally uh, poor from, uh, from uh, uh, our, our standpoint when it comes to 404B, but there's a lot of cases that are favorable cases. If you're uh, dealing with one of these cases, um, just go ahead and and, uh, and, and and email me, and I'll try to go ahead and give you some uh, some cases that are favorable to us in this area. Uh, okay. Also, I deal with that again. Uh, yes, Vanessa. Oh, I, I apologize for interrupting, but we did have an audience question that it might be helpful to clarify now from one of our viewers asked if the 404B3, um, if it's used by the defendant, does the defendant have to give the same notice as well? The, that's an excellent question. And uh, let's look at the rule here. The, the, uh, um, the, uh, the rule, and uh, uh, that is a really very good question because again, it's not sufficiently used by the defense and, uh, and, uh, uh, and we should. Uh, According to a rule, and uh, this is 404B3, notice in a criminal case, in a criminal case, the prosecution must, okay? So the rule is directly uh, aimed at the prosecution, and then the rule outlines, you know, three different things that the prosecution has to do, the matters that I outlined in, uh, um, in, the, in the prior slide. The rule is aimed directly at the prosecution. So great question. Actually, in a future presentation, I'll be sure to go ahead and add that slide. I'm glad that that question was asked. Uh, again, to be clear, the rule is aimed at the prosecution. The notice requirement is aimed at the prosecution. Thanks for that question, uh, Vanessa, and thank you, uh, audience member, for raising that issue. Very briefly, I want to talk about 413 and 413 and 414. These are similar crimes in sexual assault cases and child molestation cases. The bottom line is that in this kind of cases, if there's if you if you have a case, if your client has been charged with a, a sexual assault case or a child molestation case, and your client has a prior a similar prior, then everything that I've been talking about basically uh, goes out the window. These two rules are brutal. They are draconian rules uh, against the defense. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and according to both rules, evidence can come in for propensity. For propensity, not only for 413, similar crimes and sexual assault cases, but also in child molestation cases. So again, here all bets are off. In those cases, uh, the evidence can come in for propensity purposes, which is really it's mind boggling to me, but that's the way the rule is. Um, you know, we do have, however, uh, the two things. One is that um, federal rule of evidence for three, the balancing that we discussed earlier does apply. Number one, number two, the prosecution has got to go ahead and disclose if it intends to use the evidence, or at least you should have a uh, heads up that the prosecution is intending to use this. But these are two brutal rules uh, that are very detrimental to the uh, defense, and they really should be abolished. These are, you know, their propensity uh, rules. Uh, the defendant here is being charged for who they are, not for what they did. Now, um, so we're at a point now where we're going to shift gears. We're going to, uh, we talked already about relevance and prejudice, and we talked about character, and now we're going to talk about opinion testimony. Now, uh, this is another presentation, uh, you know, a standalone presentation that I give. So here again, I am, uh, I am uh, condensing a lot of material, but let's look at what we have here in the way of, uh, you know, just a, a mini summary. So the key thing here is that are we talking about opinion testimony? If so, is it lay or expert? If it is lay, then we need to analyze it under 701, Federal Rule of Evidence 701. If it is expert, we got to analyze it under Rule of uh, 702. Now, let's start here. Before I, I, I continue, however, you know, I will direct your attention to, an, to a very recent article. It was in the Champions August uh, 
uh, uh, publication, uh, and it's on excluding prosecution expert evidence. You know, I co wrote that author, uh, that article along with uh, my colleague, Hannah Nelson. Um, and uh, I think the, the article is a really good summary of issues that you can raise in the context of uh, trying to exclude prosecution expert evidence. So uh, this was, again, a very recent article where, you know, that summarizes a lot of the points that I'm going to be covering. Um, you know, by the way, you know, uh, I always plug the champion. The champion is an outstanding publication. Uh, so I cannot say, you know, enough good things about it. But this is, this is, I think, you know, a, a really solid article that summarizes this area. So let's start with lay opinion testimony. Uh, lay opinion testimony under the rule has to be rationally based on the witness of perception. The witness of perception, not on a treatise, not on you know on a, a academic work done by the expert and that sort of thing. It has to be based on the witness's perception. Uh, it's got to be helpful to the jury, and it cannot be based on scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. This is an area where the government often strays away from the rule, and we need to go ahead and call them on it. This is an outstanding example of that, uh, of, of how this, uh, this works out. Uh, this is uh, uh, in the article, uh, I, I, I call this the, 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 the wolf in sheep's clothing. And what the government tries to do is that the government tries to go ahead and bring in expert evidence, expert testimony uh, in the context of uh, um, a lay witness. Okay, so what happened here, for instance, is that the defendant was charged with importation uh, of uh, methamphetamine. The defendant was arrested at the Canadian border. And uh, what happened is that, uh, is that costumes went ahead and uh, costume officers retrieved um, a ton of pills uh, from the gas tank of the defendant. Uh, uh, and they were wrapped. Uh, in uh, in plastic, and then and they were in the um, in the gas tank of the car being driven by the defendant. The defense theory was that the defendant was a blind mule. Now, um, the government presented the arresting officer as a witness. The arresting officer testified that when the officer stopped the car, the the gas light was on showing that uh, that the that the car didn't have gas. However, the the officer the officer was testifying as an officer as a lay witness, not as an expert witness. There had been no notice, no no Rule 16 notice or anything like that. The officer testified that the gas tank, however, uh, in, um, was full. You know, so the officer testified that you know that the defendant must have known that there was something in the in in, in the uh, that there was a problem with the 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 gas tank and that there was something in the gas tank because the light was showing that the gas tank was full when in fact it was not okay so the prosecution was using this expert or this witness not an expert to show that the defendant should have known that there were drugs in the trunk and therefore rebutting the defense of uh, the defendant being a blind mule. Um, the defendant objected to that line of questioning that the district court allowed it, however, and uh, on appeal, the, the defendant argued that that was improper expert uh, evidence uh, given by a lay witness when there was no notice uh, or, or anything like that. The Court of Appeals agreed, the Second uh, uh, Circuit agreed, the Second Circuit concluded that the, this witness was given expert evidence. Uh, his testimony to uh, what was found on the on the um, on the on the gas tank and how that impacted and why it impacted the reading 
of the of the the, the, the little gas valve and the um, dashboard and all that all that evidence should have been considered to be expert evidence and the uh, government prior to introducing it wasn't an obligation to disclose the government didn't disclose consequently that evidence was um was improper expert evidence and the second circuit vacated the conviction and remanded the case really nice case um for again this is the the wolf in sheep's clothing phenomena that the that oftentimes the government will go ahead and try to exploit now let's look at um expert witness testimony and the requirements uh the witness first of all must be qualified the expert knowledge must be uh helpful to a trier of fact it must be based on sufficient facts or data and uh it must be a product of reliable principles and uh methods and finally the expert must have reliably applied them um so now let's go ahead and this is a really good example of uh, of a couple of these uh, uh, requirements not being met by the government. You know, here this is a really good example of the witness not being a qualified expert, of the evidence not being based on sufficient facts or data, and the evidence not being uh, uh, rely based on reliable principles and methods. What happened? You know, here in this case, in the Garcia case. This is a Fourth Circuit case. This is a, a case where the defendant was charged with conspiracy to possess uh, with intent to distribute heroin. The, the district court allowed FBI testimony uh, uh, dealing with, uh, um, with um, actually, uh, forgive me, because I'm giving you the wrong case. This case is really good if, uh, and I'll, I'll just mention it, uh, leave it in the PowerPoint. This is an excellent case where you have a situation uh, where um, the expert is testifying both as a lay expert and also as an as an expert, as a lay witness and as an expert. So what happened in this case here is that the 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 witness that was an officer was you know testifying as a fact witness as having been involved in the investigation, but also the officer provided, you know, expert testimony dealing with, um, with, uh, uh, um, with uh, coded information as far as drug-related conversations and, uh, um, and uh, language used in, uh, in this sort of uh, drug transactions and that sort of thing. And in that case, uh, the Fourth Circuit concluded that this uh, that this was uh, an improper usage of a witness for both purposes for you know for using that witness as a lay witness as well as an expert witness. The Fourth Circuit concluded that it can be done, but it has to be done you know under a whole bunch of different safeguards where the court makes it very clear that now the witness is testifying as a fact expert uh, uh, witness, and now the witness is testifying as an expert witness and that sort of thing, that didn't happen here. And uh, consequently, the court reversed. So again, if you have a situation where the government is trying to use a witness and trying to have that witness testify as a lay witness, and also as an expert witness, be very careful. And this case will give you a number of very good arguments in that regard. Going back to the point that I was trying to, to make, let me talk about the, uh, uh, the Medina Copete case here. And it, what happened in this case is that here, the defendants were charged with conspiracy uh, and intent to distribute meth. Um, and what happened is that at the traffic stop, an officer saw one of the defendants reading a prayer to the Santa Muerte or the Holy Spirit of Death. The defendant at trial objected to this evidence coming in, uh, the officer testifying as to this, 
or the expert rather testifying as to this, the government had well, one or two percent evidence by an expert that you know that uh, the defendant's prayers to the Santa Muerte meant that the defendant was part of the drug culture because typically people that that uh, that prayed uh, to the Santa Muerte or the Holy Spirit of Death were individuals that were involved in the drug trade. Now, uh, the defendants were convicted here and the, the circuit, in this case, the 10th circuit, concluded that the evidence was improper. The, uh, uh, the court concluded here that first of all, the, the so-called expert witness was a, a U.S. Marshal who had a bias for the government, whose uh, expert data came from a bias sample uh, that came from his work as a narcotics um, uh, uh, officer, uh, meaning that he was likely working again with a very biased sample, uh, and that in this case, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the evidence was not reliable. Uh, the, uh, uh, the evidence that the, uh, that was presented, uh, lacked any, uh, uh, was shallow and anecdotal and consequently, uh, the 10th circuit vacated and remanded the conviction. Uh, this is, by the way, the Santa Muerte. And again, what was going on in this case is that the officer, uh, the, the officer saw uh, uh, the defendant praying to the Santa Muerte, and the government brought in this so-called expert, who was really a law enforcement type, to testify that people that that prayed to the Santa Muerte uh, were oftentimes involved in drug dealing. Um, and the circuit did not buy that, and the circuit ended up reversing. Nice case to show uh, uh, when you know a bias, uh, a sample, uh, a data sample uh, can be biased and that sort of thing. Now, um, continuing on with expert testimony, expert testimony has to be the product of reliable principles and methods according to the rule. Reliability, of course, is is measured by uh, Daubert versus Merrill Dow. Uh, Daubert sets out uh, uh, a set of non-exclusive factors that a court can take into account. Uh, and those factors apply to uh, not only scientific evidence, but also other technical uh, evidence, uh, expert technical you know, evidence. Now, uh, the Daubert checklist include such things as whether the theory or technique has been tested, whether it has been submitted to peer review, the rate of error, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. Now, from our standpoint, what becomes really important is that a lot of stuff that we have to deal with is straight up junk science. And in my PowerPoint here, I give you a series of articles from the champion these are recent articles, uh, articles in, in the, uh, in the uh, 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 for the most part in the last few years. And, uh, and, and, and here, it, this articles talk about the national epidemic of uh, forensic science. And uh, um, this is amply demonstrated by the 2009 uh, National Academy of Sciences report that concluded that much of forensic science uh, that is used is fraud, is junk, and all that. But yet, courts continue to go ahead and allow it in. According to the National Academy of Sciences report, uh, for uh, much of forensic uh, science uh, is uh, has uh, does not you know does not have you know actual error rates. It cannot really be considered to be. You know, to 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 pass Daubert. Uh, unfortunately, again, courts have not seen that way. But the report concludes that there are significant problems with bite mark evidence, uh, hair evidence, even fingerprint evidence, firearm and tool mark identification evidence. Those conclusions were repeated in the 2016 uh, report uh, prepared 
by the uh, by President Obama's press, uh, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. These are excellent tools. Both reports are excellent tools for us to use uh, when we're trying to go ahead and challenge this kind of uh, this kind of evidence. The conclusion of both reports is that the courts are failing to perform their gatekeeping functions. Uh, that uh, that courts are allowing in evidence that is not science that has no scientific validity. That uh, the vast majority of uh, opinion of reported opinions in in uh, criminal cases show that courts rarely exclude or restrict expert testimony offered by prosecutors. That unfortunately, appellate courts are much more willing to question the admissibility of scientific evidence in civil cases, but not in criminal cases. And my experience, and my experience in, in writing the book that I, that, that, I, that, I, that I wrote on evidence shows that this is absolutely the case. Courts tend to give a pass to prosecutors when it comes to expert scientific evidence, and we need to go ahead and be very mindful of that and continue to raise you know, the issues uh, that continue to recur in problem areas like um, DNA analysis of complex mixtures, bite mark analysis, latent fingerprint analysis, uh, et cetera. You know, still we continue to have a lot of problems in these areas, and uh, we just need to, you know, continue to press on until courts start, you know, listening to our arguments. Now, so having talked about uh, some of the main issues in opinion testimony, especially you know highlighting you know issues dealing with uh, uh, lay opinion testimony as well as expert opinion testimony, let's go ahead and turn our attention to hearsay and uh, let's look at a framework on how to approach hearsay. And of course. Um, Last year, you know, I gave uh, two presentations, so for a total of four hours, that deal with hearsay at a much, you know, greater uh, length that I will be able to go ahead and talk about uh, here today. But you know, let's go ahead and first, you know, uh, talk about an approach uh, to hearsay. First of all, we start with: Is there an actual statement? Second. Is that statement being offered for its truth? Third, is the statement not hearsay under federal rule of evidence 801D? Then we look at does the statement fall into an exception under federal rule of evidence 803 or 804? And then finally, although I'm not going to really cover that uh, in this presentation, does the statement violate? the confrontation clause. This is a simple five-step way of looking at, you know, a hearsay. And again, of course, all this is included in my PowerPoint, which uh, you certainly, you know, have access to. And as I mentioned, should, you know, any one of you want to go ahead and reach out to me and uh, talk about an issue dealing with hearsay or any of the topics that I covered today, by all means, please go ahead and do that. Um, so let's go ahead and start with a hearsay definition under 801C. So first of all, you know, we have to have a declarant. I mean, that's the, that's the first thing we have to have. So, you know, Holly the parrot uh, 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 yelling uh, bloody murder, that is not going to be hearsay. Holly the parrot is not a declarant. A declarant has to be a human declarant. The same thing with Fido the dog. Fido the dog is signaling uh, to its handler that there are narcotics in uh, the defendant's uh, truck or the car. That is not hearsay. That's of course not to say that you know that it may be a whole bunch of other problems. You know the dog may be improperly trained, etc but it is not hearsay. You know, same thing, for instance, with, say, GPS coordinates. If, you know, an officer is talking about GPS coordinates or whatever, having, you know, read those coordinates, you know, that may not be hearsay. 
it is produced by a machine. And so long as there is no human interpretation, uh, so to speak, no human editing, then uh, there is really no declarant. So for a declarant, it's gotta be a human. The second thing, of course, is that it's gotta be, this is an out of court statement. Now, a lot of my students you know, in, uh, in law school, they, this is something that really trips them up. You know, they, 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 they believe that if a declarant is on the stand and is repeating something that they said out of court, so if I'm on the stand and I am repeating something that I said out of court, um, oftentimes, you know, my students think that that cannot be hearsay, but that is actually hearsay. It is an out of court statement that, you know, that is, say, being used for the truth of the matter asserted. So we need to be careful with that. A lot of times, a lot of judges think that simply because a witness is repeating something that they said out of court, that that is not hearsay, and that is false. Um, now, uh, then we get to the third prong, and that is that we have to have, of course, a statement. Now, um, a statement, um, you know, has to be an assertion, you know, an assertion such as the sky is blue, a car is passing there behind me as Las Vegas Boulevard. I'm asserting something. A question is not an assertion. A threat is not an assertion. So again, for there to be a statement and, you know, for it to come under the hearsay definition of the rule, it's got to be an assertion. That assertion has to be offered for the truth of the matter asserted. And here's where a lot of times, you know, we will go ahead and see issues where we need to be very careful about. So, not for the truth or the matter asserted. If something, for instance, uh, comes in for the purposes of showing the course of, an, or of investigation, the effect on a hearer or reader to show knowledge, or for the purposes of impeachment, that is not going to be for the truth or the matter asserted, and consequently, you will not have uh, you will not have a statement. You will not have hearsay. Uh, if it's not coming in for the offer for to, to be offered for the truth of the matter asserted, then it's not going to be it's not going to be hearsay. Now the problem here, of course, is that this is heavily abused by prosecutors, and it is very much misunderstood by judges, especially the first one, course of investigation. This is one of the most abused areas in hearsay. And, you know, and oftentimes you'll hear a prosecutor saying, well, you know, that whatever it is that the that the officer just testified to, that the officer, for instance, uh, had a discussion with the informant and the, the informant told the officer that our client was dealing drugs at his mother's house and that, you know, our client was dealing methamphetamine and all that, uh, the prosecutor will go ahead and argue that that's coming in simply to show the course of investigation, simply to show the effect on the officer, simply to show why it is that the officer did what they did, why it is that they started investigating the client, why they conducted surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, that is not the case. Again, that is an area that is, you know, that is heavily abused. Um, and, uh, uh, and and we need to keep in mind, first of all, two things. One, that this course of investigation business is subject to federal rule of evidence um, 403 analysis. You know, the analysis that we talked about earlier that, you know, that is uh, that uh, prejudice uh, overrides relevance. And so for instance, the information that you know that our client was dealing drugs at his mother's house. You know all that would come squarely under federal rule of evidence 403. It is certainly prejudicial. More importantly, the courts have found time and time again that testimony that an Afro officer acted on information received should be enough. That an officer started investigating our client because they had received investigation 
that you know would lead them to believe uh, that they needed to start an investigation on drug dealing. That should be more than enough. There's no reason why to go ahead and have the the uh, um, the evidence uh, that the officer was told by the informant that our client was dealing in drugs, that our client was dealing in drugs from at his mother's house, and all that kind of stuff. So again, this is something we need to be very careful about because this is an area that is that is uh, heavily exploited by the prosecution. Now, so we have uh, now. Let's say that we do have uh, we have a statement. The statement is being used for its truth. And as we discussed earlier, the, let's go back to our box right here and let's take a look at um, at uh, um, at box number three. Is the statement not hearsay under federal rule of evidence 801D? In other words, does the statement fall under an exclusion? So let's talk about that. Now, uh, what we have, of course, is that we got two broad baskets of uh, exclusions. And I deal with each uh, in, in the presentations that, that we did last year and the engage and exchange presentations that we did last year. And what we have is the first one is the declarant witness prior statement. And, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll give you the three different flavors of those. And then of course we have opposing party statements. These are hearsay exclusions. They are not hearsay exceptions. If something falls within, uh, within this rule, it is not hearsay. It doesn't have to come under a hearsay exception for it to come in at trial. Let's look first at declaring witness prior statement. There are three separate kinds. And let me go ahead and mention some of the more salient things we need to keep in mind for that. So first of all, you know, you have prior inconsistent statements. You have also prior consistent statements and finally statements of identification. Now, for prior inconsistent statements, those statements, ha statements have, uh, have to be made at a prior proceeding. So for instance, if you have uh, a statement that is being made at the station house, the police is questioning a witness, the police is questioning the informant or whatever, and, uh, uh, and the police uh, and the, the prosecutor wants to use that, that would not come in because that was being used at, uh, that was a statement made at the station house. That is not a prior proceeding uh, for a prior inconsistent statement to come under this definition, it has to be have been made at a prior proceeding. Second, prior consistent statements. Now, a prior consistent statement cannot come in and, and until uh, and only to rebut a claim of recent fabrication. Now, this is something that also we have to be very careful about. Typically what happens is that, let's say that, you know, you have the inform, that the prosecution has the informant on the stand. Now, the, uh, the prosecution did their direct, you did your cross, and, you know, and, and you were able to show that uh, you, you were able to impeach the, um, or discredit the witness. Now, the government wants to go ahead and bring in a prior consistent statement of this witness. And typically what they, were, they, what they would wanna bring in is statements that that informant made to the police after the, the informant already started collaborating with the police. That is not going to fall under this exception. Why? Because by then, the, the, the declarant that made that statement already had a reason to fabricate, um, already had a reason to go ahead 
and uh, and and state a falsehood. They, in this case, the informant was already cooperating with the police. If the, that is the kind of statement that the prosecution wants to bring in, that statement should be excluded, and we need to go ahead and object to that. Lastly, under this broad category, we have statements of identification, and that can be anything. It could be, you know, a prior. Uh, a prior photo ID, a prior lineup. It doesn't matter if the witness was able to make the identification in court. Still, the prior statement of identification can come in, uh, et cetera. From our standpoint, it's important to note that this obviously does not impact in any way the fact that you know we still may have you know a constitutional violation. That is that, for instance, uh, the the statement was made in a fashion that is unconstitutional because it, it, it was uh, it was uh, impermissibly suggestive. Let's say the lineup was impermissibly suggestive. The show up was impermissibly suggestive. This hearsay, uh, this exclusion is not a hearsay exception. This hearsay exclusion doesn't impact the fact that still the uh, um, the statement may be excluded for constitutional reasons. Now, so I mentioned that again, we got two big separate baskets declaring witness prior statements. This is the statements of the witness, and those are the ones that we just reviewed inconsistent, consistent, and of identification. And then the second big basket are opposing party statements. Those are hearsay exclusion. They come in, they are not hearsay. We don't have to go ahead and analyze them under the exception to the hearsay rule. And here what we have are statements of, say, our clients, uh, personal statements, adoptive statements. The key thing that usually impacts us is the last one, statements by a co-conspirator. Uh, and again, I'll note that in the prior presentations that I did, I went into much more detail, provided examples, discussed cases dealing with uh, co-conspirator statements. Suffice to say right now that, um, for the government to be able to go ahead and rely on this exclusion, the government has to show that a conspiracy, a conspiracy existed, that it involved the declarant and the defendant, that the statement was made during the course of the conspiracy and in furtherance. And oftentimes it is the third, uh, the third requirement where we can get some degree of play in uh, that it is in furtherance. In that regard, it's important to note that idle conversation is not enough. If you have, say, one of the conspirators simply BSing with somebody about, you know, how many bags of cocaine they, you know, they bagged earlier in the day and that sort of thing, that is just idle conversation. That is not in furtherance of anything. That does not qualify under the co-conspirator statement. And of course, you know, we all know how, um, how powerful and how um, unfair this co-conspirator statements, you know, can come in. So in furtherance of the conspiracy, you know, it's, it's one of the, the areas where, you know, once in a while we can go ahead and get some play, get some traction and try to get those statements excluded. Now, uh, again, as I said, idle conversation is not sufficient to qualify as being in furtherance of the conspiracy. Now, let's go ahead then and do a whirlwind tour of the hearsay exceptions. There are 23 hearsay exceptions where, in, uh, uh, where the declarant's uh, availability is immaterial. There are five where the declarant must be unavailable. We're not going to cover 28. In fact, I'm just going to briefly point uh, a total of 12 um, and dealing with, uh, let's see, two, four, six. No, actually, I got a total of 10. That's what I have. These are, um, what do you get, think of as being the principal hearsay exceptions that, that do not, where availability of the declarant is immaterial? And what I want to do is briefly cover uh, covered them, 
And then I'll, I'll briefly give you two examples of uh, hearsay exceptions that do require an availability. So let's start with talking about present sense impression. Uh, the requirements there is that the statement, you know, has to describe an event or condition while or immediately after a declarant perceived it. So, you know, Las Vegas Boulevard is right behind me, uh, and I make the statement, a blue car is driving past uh, my window in Las Vegas Boulevard. So that's a present sense impression. It's describing an event condition or condition while it is occurring, okay? So that would that statement qualify. Uh, the statement must be nearly contemporaneous to the incident. It doesn't have to be startling or anything like that. It just has to describe something as it is uh, as it is occurring or 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 um, immediately thereafter. Now, excited utterance, on the other hand, uh, is based uh, not on contemporaneity, but rather on a startling event and the person, the declarant, still being under the influence of that startling event. So if I see an accident here in Las Vegas Boulevard, and then you know I tell you uh, 15 minutes later, I just saw an accident in Las Vegas Boulevard, a pedestrian was hit by a blue car. Okay, that would not qualify under present sense impression because of time lapse, but it would qualify or excited utterance assuming that I'm still under the influence of the excitement created by that event or condition. So that, in that context, that is the driving factor right there. Now, let's look at Federal Rule of Evidence 8033, then existing mental or emotional condition. So this, you know, what qualifies under this one here, under this exception here, is, say, state of mind. So um, you know, so I tell you, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and cross this. I want to, you know, go downstairs in a few minutes and I'm going to cross Las Vegas Boulevard and I'm going to walk to the federal courthouse. I am telling you my intent that will qualify under the existing mental or emotional condition. Same thing if I tell you right now, you know, my, my knee is hurting right now. That will go ahead and qualify. However, this is uh, a statement of memory or belief does not qualify. If I tell you my knee was hurting yesterday, um, or if I tell you yesterday I crossed Las Vegas Boulevard and went to the federal courthouse, that would not come in under this exception. So uh, statements of memory or belief are excluded. So for instance, I'm scared. You know, that would come in, but I'm scared because Joe Smith, threat, uh, Joe Smith threat, threatened me uh, several days ago. That is not okay. That would not go ahead and fulfill the requirements of the rule. Another important exception is uh, a statement made for the purposes of medical diagnosis or treatment. Uh, and here, anything that would reasonably be relied upon by a healthcare provider can come in any statement dealing, you know, with uh, 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 with uh, that, that could be used for a healthcare provider. So, for instance, my knee hurt yesterday. That would come in. My knee hurt uh, is hurting right now. That would come in. If I tell tell that to a doctor, if I tell that to a nurse, that would come in. My knee hurts because I was crossing Las Vegas Boulevard and I fell and I hurt my knee, that would come in. Importantly, however, as the, a portion of the statement or a statement that identifies the perpetrator is usually excluded. So, you know, uh, I'm talking to a doctor or nurse, my knee hurt because I fell yesterday, I fell crossing Las Vegas Boulevard, and I fell because Joe Smith pushed me. 
and now Joe Smith, uh, Smith is being prosecuted for that, that would not come in because that portion of the statement, at least that portion would not come in, assigns fault or identifies a perpetrator. That part would be excluded, okay? Uh, sometimes courts have created a very narrow exception in, in child abuse cases when uh, what's being identified is the identity of the perpetrator if it is a parental figure or other figure in the household. There's a few cases that deal with that, but otherwise identification ought to not come in. Now, um, uh, uh, another obvious exception that is very important is business records. Uh, for a record to qualify, it has to be within, you know, or near the time uh, that it was prepared, transmitted with a person with knowledge. Uh, it's got to be kept in the course of regularly conducted activity, and it's got to be a regular practice of the business to keep such records. The key thing for us, if we're trying to oppose it, is trying to show that um, that the, the source of information, that the method of preparation indicates lack of trustworthiness. And it is the same uh, the, also to for us to, to keep uh, an eye on is that, you know, is that um, for a statement, a document, an item, to come under this exception, it cannot be prepared in anticipation of litigation. In addition to that, we need to look out for hearsay within hearsay, which uh, that may be excludable. A similar exception, and I'm just gonna go ahead and put it up here, I'm not gonna discuss it at length, is public records. As, uh, as I noticed that we're, we're getting close to our time. Um, the one thing that's important to keep in mind under public records is the law enforcement exclusion, and that is that under public records, 8038 bars the prosecution in a criminal case from introducing factual findings resulting from an investigation, but we can actually use those uh, factual findings. Now, uh, lastly, when it comes to the exceptions where availability of the declarant in, in material is absence of a record. Again, here, if we are if we are opposing the government, if we're trying to exclude the government uh, from uh, admitting evidence, you know, it's important to keep on uh, to to try to argue that the record keeping process that uh, uh, lacks trustworthiness. That you know, it is uh, not a systematic way of keeping record. And consequently, you know, their records, you know, should go ahead and be excluded because they lack trustworthiness. Uh, as far as exceptions that, 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 uh, that require an availability, I mentioned two, these are probably the two uh, more important ones, dying declaration and statement against interest. Dying declaration, of course, is a very sexy one. Uh, uh, law school professors love it. It is very rare. The requirements are that it's got to be a homicide case. Uh, the statement must be made while the declarant believed death was imminent and concerning the, uh, the, uh, uh, the cause of death. More importantly, statement against interest. If a statement uh, is contrary to the declarant's uh, pecuniary or prepared, proprietary interest, then that may qualify if, if the declarant is indeed unavailable. Now, um, I want to go ahead and, and uh, draw a distinction here between party admissions and statements against interest. Of course, for party admissions, they must be made by a party against whom they're being used. They do not have to be against interest when made, and the declarant can you know, be available, and still you know, the opposing party can bring them. For a statement against interest, it can be made by anyone, whether it's a party or not, uh, but the statement has to be against interest when made and the declarant has to be unavailable. As I wrap up, um, as far as hearsay exceptions, it is very important to keep in mind Federal Rule of Evidence 806 that is attacking and supporting a declarant's credibility. And a hearsay or non -hearsay, a, a, a hearsay statement or a non-hearsay one, such as a co-conspirator statement, a hearsay exclusion statement, uh, can be attacked and supported 
like any other testimony. You can treat it as if the government say brings in evidence, uh, hearsay evidence, you can treat that declarant as if, as if that declarant has testified. You can go ahead and bring a prior conviction. You can present uh, testimony, uh, opinion, reputation testimony of that individual for that, as far as that individual being a liar. You can treat them as if they were a witness that testified on the stand. Uh, and as I conclude, as far as hearsay, it's important to know that a hearsay objection will not preserve a confrontation clause challenge. You have to make a separate confrontation clause challenge to preserve the issue for appeal. Well, it has been my pleasure to be with you here. I really look forward to being here on February 8th. We're gonna be talking about objections. That's gonna be uh, a, a very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, you know, I wanna thank each one of you. I wanna thank Vanessa, for, for inviting me to, uh, to, to, to share um, uh, this presentation with you. And should you have any questions or want to brainstorm a case, please don't hesitate to reach out. And thanks again, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Renee. And if I could trouble you for one minute longer, um, we did have a question about the very last section. A viewer was asking if lack of a... Um, an, I hope the viewer will correct me if I get it wrong, but if lack of a gun carry permit um, would be considered the same as lack of a record too. Right, so the prosecution may, you know, may try to go ahead and present evidence that, you know, that the that the that records where, you know, where whatever authority is supposed to go ahead and keep track of, you know, who has uh, uh, permits and that sort of thing. Uh, that a certain person didn't obtain that permit. Again, look to see if there's ways that you can challenge that. Especially those kind of records are oftentimes incomplete. They are, you know, they're uh, they're um, they're scattered. They're a mess, and we can go ahead and argue that uh, that they don't have guarantees of trustworthiness, and because of that, they should be excluded. 